I want to talk about Gurdjieff, this work, religion, the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. I want to talk about these things because I do not teach the fourth way. I teach the fourth way according to my understanding of it, and my understanding of it is open-ended. I am not man number seven. I am not Gurdjieff. I am not Ospensky. I'm not Nicole. I am not Pogson. I'm not the Salzman. I'm not any of those people. I am me. This is what I have. I never met Gurdjieff. I never met Ospensky. I never met Nicole. I don't know, and I've never known any of those people. I have never known anyone who taught the fourth way and got it directly from those people. All the people that I know who were my teachers never knew any of them, as far as I know. If they did, they never told me about it. I don't have an official fourth way. I have the fourth way that I have. I take what I know and I apply it in my life. And the application of the knowledge that I've been able to gather and apply has given me an understanding because that's the formula. If you gather right knowledge and you apply it rightly through right effort, you will get right understanding. Right understanding will lead you to other levels of consciousness, will raise your level of being. How you will know your level of being has been raised is you will be able to actually do things in a work sense that you could not do before. These are all things that you will be able to verify and other people will be able to verify. These things are knowable, they're verifiable, they're measurable. Consciousness is measurable. Now, because we don't know how to measure it and we don't have machines for it, we think that it's not measurable, but it is measurable. Now, it may be measurable in very broad strokes. We may be able to measure it in meters, but not in millimeters. But that doesn't mean that it's not measurable. And as we raise our level of being, as we increase our, our, our consciousness, our awareness, we may become aware of smaller and smaller increments in consciousness, in level of being, that we can measure. But right now, for us, yards is fine, fields is good, cities is good, towns is good. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like, well, this is this country. This is the United States. Okay, well, in the United States, we have 50 states. It's split up into 50 states. So we can measure that we have 50 in one. So there is this level of consciousness called the United States, and we have 50 states within that. So we can measure it in that way. Well, that seems like a big way, and it is a big way. But it's really a very small way when you consider the universe. It's really very minute when you consider the universe. There are ways. One of the things that impressed me the most about Gurdjieff's teaching was that he felt like he was on a mission to bring the wisdom of the East and the science of the West together. He felt like, it appears to me, and from what I've read that he said and written, that if that didn't happen, that our world would become a failure, that this experiment on this planet would be wiped away. Now, this is not new in esoteric teaching. In all esoteric teachings, there's this end of times thing. The door closes, you either made it or you didn't make it. It's like taking a test. The buzzer goes off at a certain time. If you finished all the questions, wonderful. If you didn't, you turn the test in because the time's up. And so Gurdjieff was essentially saying, we need to get this done. We need to bring this together. And that means that you need to do this because there is no we, there is only you. That you can only work on you, you can't work on us. That the only person that a man can change is himself and that is with great difficulty. My own experience of many years of trying through self-help this and this religion and that thing and this system, was that it was a very difficult thing to do. It was easy to talk about, it was easy to write about, it was easy to go and have, to listen to lectures about, but it was very difficult to actually do it for more than 72 hours. 72 hours after the seminar, and I was pretty much back to my old self again, which was not what I wanted. I wanted a real change that would last, lasting change. And everyone promised huge lasting change, and I found that I got little lasting change. What I realized was that it was possible to change, but it was not possible to change all of it all at once. That it was going to take a long time, and it was going to be a little bit here and a little bit there. And so for 40 years, I've been doing a little bit here and a little bit there. And there are times when I just slacked off and didn't do anything at all. And even in those times, I found that I changed. And somehow, without my really knowing how, I made progress. The spirit of 
Gurdjieff's work was that he kept it open-ended. He kept people guessing. He didn't like us becoming mechanical. So what he did was he would change things. As a matter of fact, it was all about change because he understood that anything that we do over and over and over again becomes mechanical. And when something becomes mechanical, it is no longer useful to us because our aim is to be conscious, not mechanical. And you can't be mechanically conscious. You can only be consciously conscious. Here we have now people who say, well, Gurdjieff said this, and this is the way it is. Jesus said this, and this is the way it is. Buddha said this, and this is the way it is. Muhammad said this, and this is the way it is. And you can't vary from that. But those very people themselves are the ones who would have varied from that. Those very people that we idealize and make icons for whatever system we have now. Those are the people who were the iconoclasts and who would have smashed those images. If Gurdjieff were here today, my guess is he'd be podcasting. Why? Because he could. Because it would be some other way to get this out there. He wouldn't be hiding it. He wouldn't be hiding his light under a bushel. He would be putting it up on a lampstand where as many people as he could get to see it could see it. But what about protecting it so that it so that its pristine purity was so that it wasn't mixed with other lesser things and and so that it didn't lose its efficacy? I don't think Gurdjieff would have worried about that too much, quite frankly. I think that he understood that the work would purify itself, just as it always has, because that's what it has to do. The truth will always be the truth, no matter how much we gild it. Eventually, that will all fall away. All that is not true will fall away. And what will be left is what is true. All that is false that people add to it will eventually come into the light and be shown for what it is. So while people are worrying about doing it exactly the way Mr. Gurdjieff did it, well, this is exactly the way Mr. Gurdjieff said to do it. This is exactly what Mr. Gurdjieff said to do. Stand exactly like this. Put your arm exactly like this. Breathe exactly like that. Have your eyes exactly like this. Hold your head just like that. I think that he would look at that today and smack you upside the head and say, cut that out. Now do this. Because I, I, read, I read things where, where, you know, someone says to him, well, Mr. Gurdjieff, last week you said, he'll, he'll say something, well, last week you said blah, 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 blah. And he says, why would I say something like that? That's stupid. And people were always wondering, Whoa, what? And that's because he didn't want them to be doing that. He didn't let people take notes. He didn't want them to be doing that. He wanted them to be thinking for themselves. He wanted them to learn how to do this and live this. And any great teacher wants that. And any great teacher, what makes a great teacher a great teacher is the ability of a great teacher to allow mediocre students to become great. If I have to say anything more, it's because you're not ready for it and it won't do any good to say it.